I, I don't think you value it as much, even if the service is just as valuable. There's just something there. I go to Costco, I get a free sample. I'm not going to value that free sample as much as if I had to pay $25 to get, you know, tapas at a tapas restaurant. We got Tony Maritato here, as well as Dr. Melanie Carminati. And uh, for those that don't know, so she is a pelvic floor physical therapist. She owns Inspira Physical Therapy here in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we've referred patients to each other. Uh, they're doing a ton of big things. They just moved into a larger space uh, very recently. Mm -hmm. And um, I just found this out. March is Endometriosis Awareness Month. And that's probably why she and the, the team have a endometriosis symposium which i think is tonight so thank you melanie for your time this early because i know it's like <laughs> tonight so you have a long day ahead i do i do thank you so much for having me really happy to be here absolutely so i know you have a tight schedule you got to run soon um, i would love to hear about the symposium i know that you yeah. are hosting it now in your new location this evening yes. it looked like before it might have been at another place so like like why why even hold it initially? And then we're kind of kind of get into like maybe the, the practice in you know business components and the marketing components around it. Sure, absolutely. So endometriosis is a disease that affects one in ten women. And it is often a long journey to get the diagnosis. I believe they say about even eight to ten years to actually get the diagnosis itself. So there's many, many symptoms, including pelvic pain, painful periods, pain with intercourse bloating, gastrointestinal stuff. So it just really impacts quality of life. Um, and March is Endometriosis Awareness Month. And last year, we decided to have our first endometriosis event here in Brooklyn because we were just seeing so many patients with endometriosis and their journey. And I learned about a documentary called Below the Belt and actually showed the documentary at our event last year. So last year, we had it at Littlefield NYC, which was a larger venue where they had like a very large screen for projecting a documentary. And then we had a smaller panel discussion afterwards and Q&A. It was an amazing event. It was really um, passionate, lots of emotions, like heartfelt. People really showed up and just shared their journeys and asked a lot of important questions and because of that and because of the success of that event, I wanted to have it again this year. Um, and this year we're having it in our office. Um, we just moved in, as you know, uh, in January. So our event this year is smaller. We're not selling as many tickets. We're actually sold out for tonight, but we're going to be recording the event because I had many physical therapists and providers send messages asking, are you going to live stream it? Can I buy a recording after? So there will be a recording after. Um, yes. Awesome. So, uh, so Tony, have you heard of, uh, like, like paid type of like seminars, talks, symposiums, summits? Um, I feel like it's more, I, we've seen a lot more on like the practice management side where there's like practice owners selling consulting or, uh, some courses or whatever, but have you seen like a, a paid type of symposium or summit on the patient facing physician facing side of things from a private practice? Yeah, I would say COVID accelerated all of that. You know, it's one of those things where um, technology has come so far so fast. One of the things besides patient facing, which I love that you're doing, Melanie, one of the things I'd love to ask you, because I've talked about this a lot, I haven't seen it done as much in women's health, but I think it absolutely should. Uh, do you ever bring either students DPT students or other students or even clinicians now that want to move into your space, do you ever bring them into one-on-one -on -one consultations, obviously with HIPAA compliant consents and the approval of the patient? But I always say like, you're in Brooklyn, I'm in Ohio. If I had somebody on my team that wanted to step into the women's health space, I don't have access to it. We don't have enough therapists around here. I've seen it done two ways in other topics. One is the student comes and sits in with you virtually. But then the other option that I would love to hear about is if we have a person that needs any kind of women's health or pelvic floor or anything like that, I don't have access to a therapist. Could I bring you in virtually 
it's my patient, my patients in my exam room, in my clinic, I am paying you. And it's a hybrid, you're educating both of us, but you're also delivering services to that individual. It's a great question. So an interesting because it just came up in conversation this week uh, with one of the guests that we're having, Dr. Juan Salgado of Puerto Rico. He is an endometriosis surgeon in Puerto Rico, and he has asked to bring uh, two physical therapists to our office um, in the upcoming months so that they can train and learn more. So that is something that is just going to be starting for me. In person and or virtually? He's actually going to bring them in person because a lot of what we do is manual skills. However, what you do bring up in terms of virtual consultations and collaboration, the portion where it would be helpful would be with the subjective history taking. So for the subjective history taking, there's a lot of very specific questions we ask that can lead us to, you know, make a differential diagnosis. You know, most of the information that we gather when we're forming those diagnoses is from the subjective and then we do the objective to confirm. So, um, yeah, it's possible. Haven't done it yet. But the in-person training for other physical therapists is going to be happening at our practice soon from um, from Puerto Rico. So. You know, I remember, Dave, you're going to appreciate this. Rob Vining, he was an MDT therapist. I don't do any MDT stuff. I had a patient who had some cervical issues. And I was like, I'm just going to bring Rob into my clinic virtually. I have no training in MDT. I don't do any of those techniques. But I always said something is better than nothing. So if I didn't have anybody around, then I'd rather have somebody virtually, even if they couldn't put hands on my patient. And when I think of women's health, pelvic floor, I also had an individual, a male patient who had seen a physician, had a referral for male pelvic floor evaluation. He was a close friend of mine. So he came to me and I was like, I have no idea. I can't do this. But again, if I had access to somebody, even virtually, even who didn't have the ability to put hands on a patient or do the things they would do in person, something is better than nothing. Um, and, and I think we could absolutely leverage, I'm the licensed clinician, I'm providing the evaluation, I'm providing the billable service, even though I'm concurrently also getting the education while I'm doing it. Uh, I think there's a huge market for that. Definitely. I mean, I, I think there's some practice owners that might watch or listen and, and be wary about like the liability there. There's always going to be practice owners and therapists that bring up the li liability component. So what about that, Melanie? Is that something that like, I guess, could be figured out and solved and communicated with some simple forms? Sure, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think in, in terms of the subjective history, that's something that that anyone who doesn't have pelvic floor manual therapy skills or uh, training can do, right? Or they can be present for. Like many of the questions we'll ask are, how's your urination? How are your bowel movements? Do you have pain with intercourse? Things like that. And those are things that you guys can ask as well. Um, but obviously we would be more comfortable talking about it because it might lead into deeper conversation about sex and pain with specific positions or pain with initial penetration and, and things like that. So obviously pelvic floor PTs will be most comfortable talking about that. But I think from a liability standpoint, there's no concern there. From um, objective manual assessment side, there is a lot of orthopedic assessment that we do as pelvic floor PTs. We're not just looking at the pelvis. We're not just doing internal manual. So we're looking at the lumbar spine. We're looking at the hips. We're doing assessment of psoas, iliacus, overall abdominal muscle integrity. If you do visceral manipulation, we do that as well. So those are things that orthopedic PTs can do as well and feel comfortable and have no concerns for liability there, but for pelvic floor internal, obviously, um, you would definitely need training for that. I don't, um, I don't recommend that without having training. Sure. Let me so, ask you, I'd, I'd love to get your perspective on this. So one of the topics that we always discuss in outpatient orthopedic is the shortage of staff, shortage of access to clinicians. I think every single practice owner in the country could grow their practice if they had access to clinicians and they had enough budget to pay the clinician what the clinician needs to feel appreciated and to survive. Now you're in a niche that's even worse when it comes to that. 
So, uh, you know, what are you guys from pelvic floor therapists, women's health, what are you guys looking at into the future to say, okay, these are the action steps we're taking, or this is what we want to do to increase access so that we can have more clinicians trained in this specialty Mm -hmm. available to the people who need it. Every physician, I talk to a lot of primary care docs, every single one of them is like, wait, there's a therapist who wants to do that, who wants to handle these things? Where are they? Like we would flood them with patient referrals. So we actually host Herman and Wallace courses in our office. So we hosted at our uh, previous office and we will be hosting more in this office as well. Um, And I also host other expert pelvic floor physical therapist. We actually have an upcoming course with Leela Abate um, on April 20th and 21st in our office. So that is how I try to give more opportunities for physical therapists to get trained. Um, And then also Herman and Wallace is the gold standard and they for training for pelvic floor PT. So having them, I've been a teaching assistant with them as well. Um, Having them and bring having them bring their course into our office has been really tremendous for getting more uh, physical therapists trained. Awesome. How about um, the practice model in terms of you know in, insurance or out of pocket? Like, how do you guys navigate that? Yeah. So we are primarily out of network, cash based. However, we are in network with Medicare. That is a new thing for us as of this year when we moved into this new office, and. Uh, so essentially most and majority of the pelvic floor patients that we're seeing are using out of network benefits but they pay up front and then we can either submit on their behalf or we give them a super bill whichever they prefer because some people still prefer to do the submitting themselves is what we've learned but um yeah so that's how we do do that all right dave how about, uh, so back to the summit, the the lineup, I'm curious, you know, is it some of your other therapists as well? Obviously, you're going to be kind of hosting yeah. and speaking um, and some other uh, pelvic floor physicians or, or, or pain specialist yeah. physicians. Um, like what, what's the lineup and, and who's going to be speaking and maybe go into maybe who's speaking and, and like what topics tonight? Great. So it's a mix of endometriosis surgeons, pain psychologists, gastroenterologists, pelvic floor physical therapists, pain physiatrists, and did I say acupuncturist yet? I don't think so. So it's going to be starting with Dr. Amanda Chu. She is from Sechkin Center and EndoFound. She's an endometriosis surgeon there. She's going to be presenting on the surgical journey for a patient. After her will be Dr. Deborah Barbieri. She's an amazing pain psychologist. So as I mentioned, one of the primary symptoms that people with endometriosis have and experience is pain, pelvic pain, pain with intercourse, painful periods, things like that. So, and as we all know, and uh, physical therapists, I think are really one of the leading providers to educate a lot about pain science. Um, I knew it was important to have her because it is, it affects your mindset. So you need to be working with a psychologist as well. It takes a team. After her will be Dr. Michael Lewis. He's an endometriosis surgeon here in Brooklyn. He was on our panel last year and uh, he will be presenting about what is happening right now in residencies and fellowships for minimally invasive surgeons or OBGYNs who are following that journey. After that will be Dr. Murray Orbach. He's a gastroenterologist and specialist in endometriosis. And then I will be doing a short presentation um, of the same presentation I did at the Endometriosis Foundation of America, speaking about the pelvic floor and how endometriosis affects that and what we do. Uh, Then we'll have a short clip from Dr. Juan Salgado of Puerto Rico. Um, He is the endometriosis surgeon that I mentioned just before. He will be talking about endometriosis mapping, which is a unique imaging technique uh, that is being used in a few select places around the world, but is not uh, really dispersed throughout the world yet. And then we'll have a pain management panel discussion with Dr. Seiferman and Dr. Kane from Manhattan Pain Medicine, myself and Dr. Mila Lahanda. Uh, she's the other pelvic floor physical therapist on my team. Peggy Robinson, acupuncturist at Cornerstone Healing in Brooklyn. And then we are actually closing off the night with Deborah Kopakin 
who is the New York Times bestselling author of Lady Parts. Um, yes, there will also be some art on display. I know that's a mouthful, but I've yeah. said this every time. I've I'm impressed this. that you didn't have notes and you were able to, to rattle all of that off. Oh, there's more. There's more. <laughs> so uh, last year, I mentioned that we showed a documentary. In that documentary, they followed the journey of three women. One of the women uh, was a New York City-based artist, and her name is Kyung John Miranda. And it's really coming full circle for us tonight because her artwork is now on display in our office. And she's going to be selling small prints. And um, I didn't mention this yet, but fertility is a challenge for people with endometriosis. And so her journey, we were following her in her um her challenges with getting pregnant and at the end of the documentary i'm not going to ruin it but anyway um her 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 son is going to be there with us so i guess i just ruined it and her husband who actually is an artist and they co-authored a uh, a book called luz la luminosa which is a comic book following the life of a superhero who finds out she has endometriosis and as it follows her journey she learns that she can still be a superhero even if she has endometriosis so there's a lot happening tonight um and a lot of important people are going to be there and um i think that's why it's sold out now but uh again a recording is going to be available so and just for people watching so the live event in person sold out can't get tickets to that the recording is going to be available for sale for purchase is it, I missed it. Is there access to it virtually live or that's not available? Yeah, I'm not doing that this year. Gotcha. I'm probably going to do it next year because also um, some of the physicians who are involved this year are already talking with me about next year. <laughs> and um, I am going to likely have next year be a little bit larger, likely at a venue probably the same one, honestly, because I liked the venue we used last year. And I'll be going through the process of getting some CEU approval um, for for that for next year. But yeah, wow. each year each year is kind of like a slight modification. And um, yeah, it was just troubleshooting and seeing how it would go, but it, it's going pretty well. That's awesome. And I know a lot of people watching this show, they're practice owners, either just getting started or they're established practice owners. If you have a couple more minutes, if you would discuss or whatever you're comfortable with, what is your business model like? The biggest struggle I hear for anybody who wants to step into women's health pelvic floor is, again, we can't find therapists or as soon as we get a therapist, they're book solid and then I've got a waiting list and I can't get patients in to see that therapist. Um, if that therapist chooses to move to another location, I can't replace that therapist. So what is your current business model like? Um, well, can you elaborate more on what you mean with that? I, I think people would just love to hear like, you're a private practice. We have yes. this many clinicians. You already okay. mentioned you're primarily sure. out, out of network. Any yeah. details about it? Right. So we are a private practice. I have uh, two other full-time physical therapists who are pelvic floor PTs and also do ortho. Um, I'm the third physical therapist. I have three Pilates teachers, um, and we the rest of the team is is administration. Um, so we are out of uh, pocket cash base. We patients pay up front, and then we can submit on on behalf on their behalf for reimbursement, or they can get a super bill. Um, and then we just uh, went in network with Medicare. But um, yeah, so we do pelvic floor physical therapy and complex orthopedics. For complex orthopedics, it tends to be chronic pain, but also we see a large volume of patients with HSD and EDS. So we've kind of become like a, a, a niche practice because we do pelvic floor PT, which is already a niche. And then we also are treating um, some unique diagnoses like Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, EDS, and then HSC, Hypermobility Spectrum Disorder, which seems kind of um, simple when you um, have a, like a general understanding of that uh, condition, hypermobility, you know, excessive motion at the joints. 
but there are so many comorbidities and I'm actually going through a training program with the EDS society right now. It's, um, it's, it's complex. And so those patients yeah. are complex. So and where, where are most of your referrals coming from and what, how are you guys handling? Cause I'm sure you're booking up. Yeah. So once you're booked up, like how are you handling then new referrals that are coming in? Right. So I should add in there that we are hiring for another full-time physical therapist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if anyone who's listening or, or both of you know someone um, who has pelvic floor experience and ortho experience, send them over. But uh, we are a mix. It's pretty much 50-50 of referrals from providers, from physicians, um, from acupuncturists, from massage. Um, I'm pretty old school, I think, with how I started my business. I am also a Pilates practitioner. So when I started uh, my practice, it was just me. I was renting a space within a Pilates studio. And I was also teaching Pilates um, in the neighborhood. And then, you know, I because I'm a Pilates person, I was a dancer, just developed a community and just really networked. So I just really networked and met a lot of people who were in that world. Um, so a lot of referrals come from that and from physicians. Um, and then the other 50 is online and um, um, yeah, people searching, people search specific things like pelvic floor physical therapy in Park Slope or hypermobility physical therapy. Um, so it's a, it's a mix of those things. Um, yeah. And then obviously, you know, the word of mouth is, is in that other 50 of referrals too. So. Dave, not to cut you off, but my last question, I promise. So what encouraged you guys or what was behind the decision to start accepting Medicare contracting with Medicare? Cause I have to think it's 50% reimbursement on what you would be charging as a cash office. Yeah. You, you know, it, it's hard to afford to pay to accept Medicare referrals and pay your team what they need. What was behind that decision? Um, so, you know, I was thinking more bigger picture with um, compliance um, because my business in Spear is growing. I wanted to make sure that we were being compliant with everything with Medicare and wanted to reduce any risks um, associated with, you know, potentially treating Medicare patients um, and having them pay cash. So I, I had us go in network with Medicare. However, you know, it is a very small percentage of what we see. So, and the appointment times are shorter than our, uh, patients who pay out of pocket, who are paying cash because of that reimbursement. So from a business owner standpoint, it was really, um, compliance, uh, risk reduction and, um, you know, also many of the patients who are coming to us for uh, and are using Medicare, they're also coming to take Pilates classes. So it's it's a different um, um, community where we are. So it just works for what we have going on. Nice. I, 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 know, you have to, uh, I know you got. Yeah, I know you have to run. Uh, any pelvic floor physical therapist, uh, if they want to connect with you, or any therapist, um, whether it's LinkedIn, your website, anything like that. Yeah. So on Instagram, we are at Inspira Physical Therapy spelled out. We're also on TikTok at Inspira PT Pilates. LinkedIn, you can just find me, Melanie Carminati. And uh, if you want to email me directly, feel free. My email is Melanie, M-E-L-A-N-I-E at InspiraPT.com. That's I-N-S-P-I-R-A-P-T.com. So yes, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, hopefully we talk again soon. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for your time. Bye-bye. And I, I know she was, I just, you just put it in the chat, Tony. I wanted to ask her and I'll, I'll figure it out uh, after this, but she, yeah, they also own brooklynphysicaltherapy.com. How about that for a domain name? Yeah. Very nice. Uh, you know, so that, that was one of my original ideas was just, and I know it's not unique to me, but was going into major cities and just buying those domains, building a general physical therapy website on something like that, and then selling it to the highest bidder. Yeah, I'm surprised that there's not um, more domain squatting around all that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So Dave, what do you think?
So uh, super impressed. Um, I I'll have to look it up. I was going to ask her like again, like the cost of the ticket, and I was curious. Uh, I know we were kind of tight on time, but if she had any pushback from patients or like the public about like why is it paid? I, you and I know that there's cost in in terms of refreshments and the utilities of the space and cleanup and you know video recording and videography, whatever. So obviously, um, but uh, I was just curious about some of those logistics because maybe. I don't know. Like you and I also know that when someone pays for something, they might uh, they might have they might value it more. They might be less likely to no show or or just not go to the symposium tonight. But if they paid whatever, 20, 30, 50 dollars a ticket or whatever, um, they're much more likely to show up and then therefore, you know, consume the content, be engaged, all that. So then she has like an active, you know, audience. Um, I don't think we covered any of that, did we? No, but it's a, it's a hundred percent true. I mean, and you know, that even plays into my question about accepting Medicare, opening the door. And I understand, I want to talk about what she said about compliance, because that's a really important issue. But I think once you open that door to third party reimbursement, particularly Medicare, a lot of those Medicare beneficiaries are going to have a supplemental plan in the secondary, they're not going to have any out of pocket expense. And I think it ch completely changes the experience and changes the business model. You know, she's created such an amazing business model. I see this with women's health, pelvic floor all the time. Um, they have such a unique perspective. They has, have such a unique patient care experience. They feel compelled to want to grow that business, to expand services. Um, oftentimes they, and I didn't ask her about this, but oftentimes they have razor thin profit margins because they're paying their therapists so much. So you go from, you know, $250, $300 a session to $100, $105 a session. All of a sudden, you realize really quickly, all of my profit is gone. Everything is going to the clinician. Um, it just changes things. But to what you were saying, when a patient isn't paying because the insurance is picking up the full allowed amount, I, I don't think you value it as much, even if the service is just as valuable. There's just something there. I go to Costco, I get a free sample. I'm not going to value that free sample as much as if I had to pay $25 to get, you know, tapas at a tapas restaurant. Uh, I don't know if that's a good comparison, but yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> but it's one of those things where when I think about, obviously, I, I love business. When I think of business, business models, uh, it's interesting to see where that whole demographic is going. And like I said, I mean, I didn't get to ask her and I wanted to so badly. What about male pelvic floor? You know, I wonder what the numbers are. If she, if she knew what the numbers are with how many therapists, PTs, how many OTs are out there certified and delivering pelvic floor services. And then how many of those are focused on men, I could probably name four in the entire country that I know of. Yeah, that are I only specific, one. yeah, two of them I think are in New York, but that are specific to male pelvic floor issues. Um, so like I, I've said this in the past, if I was a therapist working as a therapist today, that would be my niche in a heartbeat. I'd go into male pelvic floor because I could command any price I had unlimited access. I could work anywhere in the country. Like it opens every single door. Um, if I was a practice owner, I would try to educate and, and train therapists to get into male pelvic floor and I would open that door. Um, but, you know, there's so much opportunity. Yeah. Another thing that Inspira, uh, another modality they use is to car therapy. Have you heard about that? No. Um, I don't know. It, it it's it's some type of like stimulation device, and uh, there's like a probe. I, I don't have anything that kind of you know, but you kind of the probe is kind of like becomes part of your hand, and then you can kind of I don't know treat uh, chronic conditions, orthopedics, etc. Externally, uh, pelvic floor pain potentially, um, but that's another thing that I don't. Know, maybe we'll have to have her back on, and we have a whole bunch of other follow up questions. Um, that they use to car therapy, which is a lot more popular in Europe. Like when I've been in, um, I don't know, like, like Spain and some other countries like walking around and then you see like signs for it. Um, it, for whatever reason, like it's way more popular in other countries and I think less common here. Um, but it's something that you, I think the patient, you actually kind of feel like the, the treatment and the, and the stimulation 
similar to like a like a tens as opposed to like um you know ultrasound where you don't really feel any treatment being actually delivered um so that's something that they also have um in their clinic and they they've done a and Spear has done a great job with just like on social media um they'll invite physicians over to the office and then they're treating the physician with the machine wow yeah, it's some something that I love that she's doing that I I had talked about a long time ago, but I don't see clinicians doing it enough is incorporating the physicians into what she is doing. So having this event and then inviting physicians to come in and be guest speakers, be featured speakers. Um, so much of what I see, you would ask me about other you know events like this. It's almost always just therapists. Is therapist talking to therapists, sometimes therapists talking to the patient community, but it's very rarely therapists bringing guest speakers, physicians, surgeons in. And, you know, I'm not a fan of workshops. We knew a lot of, a lot of therapists who use workshops to try and build referrals and to get new patients. I hate workshops, but if I was going to do a workshop, the only reason I would do a workshop is to invite a specific target physician who I want to build a relationship with, who I want to get more referrals from. And we used to do this. We had an orthopedic down in Florida. He was a, a cyclist. We invited him to give a workshop on total hip replacement and patients who want to go back to cycling after a total hip replacement. The only reason why we did it, we hosted it. We bought the food. We did everything. I didn't care if I got a single referral out of the attendees. All I wanted was to build that relationship with that orthopedic surgeon so that we could then start to drive referrals from him in the future. You know, the modern version of that is obviously I do it on Zoom. We've got a bunch of Zoom interviews with surgeons really from all over the country. And the only reason why I'm doing that is piggyback SEO. And we can talk about that if you're interested, building my relationship with that surgeon so that I establish my own authority in the niche. And then potentially, whether it's virtual or in-person referrals, um, that's where I think a lot of time it, it should be spent from small startups that don't have the budget to run Google ads, Facebook ads, things like that, but want to start driving referrals from relationships. So let's let's continue on that. So I right now i want to do this i want to um and there's nothing holding me back other than i i want to make a so i want to interview physicians because obviously that's i've been doing it for years so it's super easy to do that but then it's like where do i put it I, i'm not going to put it on the dave kittle show because it's kind of like clinician practice owner facing so there's other folks considering the same thing right tony so like for me it's like i i think i even asked this to you before i was like then i i have to make a new youtube channel and then like then i got to think of like a title like am i going to call it uh i i thought of like a title or like a a channel name pain relief or balance or or something around like we treat orthopedics and neurological conditions or something like justin stiver like you know the active adult or something like that um there that's my biggest uh i don't want to say excuse but that's like the thing like where am i gonna if i do this like i have you know a, a podiatrist that's nearby that uh that i've taken out for a meal like we're on good terms like he would definitely do it he's put out content on his instagram so he'd be interested and i would just be able to start interviewing physicians get them in the spotlight you know everyone loves to be in the spotlight everyone loves to be you know ask questions about themselves so that's that's fine what are your tips for me or for others of where do I put that? Obviously, it makes sense to use YouTube because of the SEO and Google because Google owns YouTube. Um, but then I got to create a new channel, right? So like, what are my what are my options or am I overthinking it? I think you're overthinking it. Um, and it depends on the platform. So we'll hit a couple different platforms. But let me ask you first what would this interview be for? So the podiatrist, you would interview that person. Would that be to drive more referrals to your physical therapy business? 100%, yes. So then that interview would go on your physical therapy business YouTube channel. Um, and, and the reality is you're probably going to get 20 views. Doesn't matter. Like the fact is you're doing something for that podiatrist. There's a certain level of reciprocity that's going to develop. They're going to feel compelled to do something nice for you. Um, even if you don't get any, any views on your channel, obviously that's a piece of content they can put on their channel. They should put on their channel. 
I would say when it comes to YouTube specifically, it would go on your business YouTube channel, not on the Dave Kittle show. But when we go to Instagram, it, it would just go in your normal Instagram feed because it's just talking about you. Um, when we looked at LinkedIn, you know, it could go on your personal LinkedIn profile, but it would go on your business LinkedIn page also. If you created an article, so a couple of years back, I interviewed a local orthopedic surgeon. Then I created an article for my website that said best, I think it was like best knee surgeon in Fairfield, Ohio, because I knew that would rank high for people that are searching for the best knee surgeon in their city state. And so I put that on my website. I didn't have LinkedIn back then, but that would be something that I would create a LinkedIn article, not a LinkedIn post a LinkedIn article optimized in the same way. Best specialty in city state. I would put that out there. I'd embed the YouTube video in that LinkedIn article. LinkedIn articles will rank organically in YouTube. I would put it on Pinterest. I would optimize the title of the pin for the surgeon's name because people are gonna be searching that surgeon. You know, if you wanna hit somebody earlier in the process, a patient who's got osteoarthritis in their knee, they're, they're experiencing knee pain, they're, they're experiencing difficulty walking, things like that. They're generally not going straight to the therapist. They're generally looking for options in their area. Who's the best knee surgeon, knee doctor, bone doctor? These are all keywords that have been established by Google. They're searching that. And so you want to put as many opportunities for platforms to rank early in those search results. I would put it on Pinterest. I'd put it on LinkedIn. If you do TikTok, I'd put it there. Uh, obviously, YouTube, Instagram, all of these platforms. It doesn't have to be, you can have one piece of content that gets shared across all of them, but you're optimizing those titles to see what's going to show up in organic search results. That's basically what I would be doing. But the most value to that provider is if you're willing to give them the raw footage or the edited video so that they can then share it across any of their platforms. You know, a, a story I always share is I interview one of my local non-surgical orthopedics. I can get 10 to 15,000 views on my YouTube channel. He puts it on their hospital page to get like 20 views. So I have more reach than they do, but I also give him that because then they could put money behind it and run it as part of a paid ad campaign. Um, there's just a ton of stuff. So, yeah, I don't currently have a, a YouTube channel for the practice. And I did ask you this, like, I don't know, probably months ago about either uh, the channel being named Concierge Pain Relief, my practice name. Or something different, like just, so. Justin Cyber, there, there are they still total therapy down there? The the seven or eight or locations that they have. Yeah. So the way, and and this isn't coming from Justin, so I don't want to put words in his mouth. But the way I understand it is, they have Total Therapy Solutions Florida. That's Justin's company. But then they have a separate channel, which is I think it's called the Active Adult or something along those lines. Yeah. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to break into a new market with that. He's doing an amazing job with it. Um, it's just like I have, and this is YouTube specific. I have my total knee replacement channel, which is connected to my business. So it's not called the total knee replacement channel. It's called total therapy solutions because I want that driving traffic to my business. But then separately, I had created the shoulder something, shoulder guide or something, because I wanted content that was specific for post-surgical rotator cuff repair information. I didn't want a video go about a knee replacement going to a shoulder patient and vice versa, but I didn't connect that to my business because my focus isn't rotator cuff repair for, for in the clinic patient care. Um, I created Learn Medicare Billing because that's focused on therapists. I created the Choose PT First because that's focused on the directory website. I've got four or five channels on YouTube that are very, very specific and focused on different aspects of my overall business. But a platform like Instagram, a platform like TikTok, a platform like Facebook, I wouldn't worry as much about oh. creating those unique silos. I would just throw everything into one spot because those feeds are going so fast. And once it's gone, it's gone. You know, they're not serving you back a video from three years ago like YouTube will. Got it. 
Got it. Well, uh, I'll have to check with Nate or whoever else wants to help me uh, potentially launch the the practice side, the patient facing side, or the patient and physician facing side of the YouTube. But it makes sense because of the the SEO juice. Um, what else around this, or or anything else? Well, and and for your you know new YouTube channel, that's going to be your business YouTube channel for your practice. I would absolutely, first thing, do an intro video, day in the life of Dave Kittle, what concerts pain relief is all about, like what makes you different. Um, I, I would potentially start to share videos that give people a glimpse into your personality, your treatment philosophy, like who are the patients that do best with you. Um, I would probably put five videos up as quick as possible. An introduction video, uh, kind of a general information video, maybe something about the history of you and where you came from, why you became a therapist, like all of this relationship building content, because that's what people are going to be looking for. When somebody is on, who's going to find that channel? It's going to be the person who's like looking up Dave Kittle or anyone on your team, because they already know about you. They already referred potentially to you, but they want to see who you are. They want to hear you. They want to look at you. They want to get get a sense for what you're going to do to them. That's generally the idea. Um, those would be the first things that I would get up there. And then the rest of it, like I, like you said, is more just a, a repository for those physician interviews and relationship building, things like that. And then um, I know that you do a lot of videos just from your iPhone. So for YouTube, does it make sense to just do them all? holding the phone, you know, horizontally, the iPhone horizontally, and then I guess vertical if you're doing like the YouTube shorts or does it matter or not matter either way? Yeah, I, I shoot everything horizontal landscape mode because that's what the platform is designed for. Then when I'm creating shorts, I'll go into those horizontal videos and pull the vertical clip out. I'll either do that just all natively on on my phone, I'm getting excited. I got too close. Um, or, you know, I'll use CapCut or some other editing software. But personally, I mean, you, you'll hear people that'll say, if you want to do a, a short, do it vertical. If you want to do long form, do it horizontal. That's true. But we don't always have that. You know, we don't always have that capability. So if, if I just do everything in horizontal landscape, um, I can always go in and pull shorts. And I like the way a short clip looks when it's zoomed in from a landscape perspective. Um, I just use my iPhone most of the time. Now, if you want to get super fancy, so mine is a 12. The uh, This camera is going to be a thousand times better than this camera. So if I can, I try to record everything not in selfie mode, but with the forward facing camera that also stops me from looking at myself instead of looking at the camera. Right now, every interview, if you guys watch, I will look at the camera. I don't look at the screen. This is me looking at the screen. This is me looking at the camera. I think it has a huge impact on the connection between you and the audience. Yeah, but I mean, I for my laptop, I'm looking at the, right next to the camera. There's like a little green dot. So I just I have to I have to be looking at you or t or Jimmy on the screen. It's if I'm looking at this like little technology piece. I don't know. I just it's it, it's tough. I don't know how you do. You, you get used to it. You, something happens. A switch flips, and I know Dave Cadle is behind that piece of glass, even though I can't actually see you. Um, one tip that I used to do when I was on a phone and I'd always look at the screen is I would take a sticky post-it note. I'd take a hole puncher. I'd punch a hole that would fit over the lens on the, the phone. And I would stick that there to cover up the rest of the phone. So I can't see the green light. I do that on a laptop too. I can't see the green light. I can't see the screen. I can't see anything. I can't believe Apple or any of these companies hasn't embedded a video in the screen so that we can look at the human we're talking to, but at the same time, look at the camera. It seems like it would take like two or three pixels. It would be no big deal. I just can't believe that doesn't exist yet. Oh, segue. Speaking of Apple, they are, I don't have my AirPods. They're in the other room. Apple's, they just filed a patent recently, Tony, for the newest AirPods to be sensing bio signals from the body, including potentially uh, like vital signs or, or EMG activity. 
Uh, I don't know if that has any implications for physical therapists, but it sounds interesting. Yeah. How could you not? Now, are you one of those people I've heard of people doing this that follow patent filings to see what these companies are doing in the future? I follow Instagram accounts that follow the patent filings of companies like Apple. So uh, not exactly, indirectly. So two cool things. Uh, yeah, there are people out there, probably investors, that follow patent filings to see what these companies are doing down the road. And then there are also people that follow like job listings to see what these companies are hiring for to get a sense for what they're doing down the road, what else is coming. You know, th these businesses operate at such a different level. Um, I, I think we could learn so many lessons from them as private practice owners. For sure. Now, real quick, because we're still live. Do you see in the top left hand corner the, uh, the the eyeball of how many people are live here? Do you see that or no? Oh, top. yes, yes. So, yeah. I do. Oh, I, I never know the next to the duck head. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so that, that's like an eyeball views or whatever. So we got 72 uh, people live. I don't know. Jimmy said they, <clears throat> it might be bots. Oh, I don't see that. I don't see 72 people. I see three out of 21. That's what I see. Oh, mine, mine says live 46 minutes and 12 seconds so far. Okay. I see live 46 minutes, but I don't have that view <laughs> that you have. I don't have the radar thing and I don't have the eyeballs, but that's awesome. So Jimmy just shared it on the screen. Did you see that? There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have that view. Oh man. J Jimmy, you gave me like, uh, I don't know. I've, I've, I've seen the, the live view this whole time. So I don't know, maybe I have some, some co-host view that, I mean, Tony's got to get plugged into. I don't know. Well, that's amazing. Bef I know we've got about 15 minutes. Do you have any topics burning a hole through your computer? I mean, the biggest thing was uh, that we touched on was the the YouTube component for video, which we talked about. Um, I, I certainly think that that can help uh, with short term and long term physician marketing, building relationships, building referrals. Um, other than that, like we have some other concierge practices referring to us, and what I see, what I see working um, is just over communication. I mean, it, maybe it sounds like obvious or simple. Um, but in terms of any of these physicians or nurse practitioners or PAs or some of the care coordinators from these practices, we just over communicate, like whether it's email, text, quick response the same day over email, um, text, whatever, like, hey, you know, we evaluated this, we, you know, today we evaluated or my therapist scheduled this new patient, the patient that you refer to us, they're scheduled at this date. Thanks again for the referral. I'll loop back in. I'll, I'll let you know how it goes, whatever. Um, Anything else around that? Yeah, I, I'm going to go the opposite direction from you. I under communicate. I under communicate <laughs> intentionally. Um, yeah, and again, we're in different business models, right? But I, I would say, and and don't quote me on this, we probably get five to ten new patient referrals a week. Uh, I do zero marketing, no paid ads. I send my referring doctors, and we have a. a pretty large group of referring doctors across multiple practices, right? So it's not like I get 20 from one doc a month. I get two and three from a bunch of different docs. Some, Many of them hospital-owned docs, some of them independent docs. Um, but the way I look at it is they already referred this patient to me. They already know me. They like, trust me. They're like, I have the connection with them. My uh, uh, objective is to protect their time not consume their time. They don't need to hear how their patient's doing unless they specifically ask for that. They they don't want to know what I'm doing. They they've they've already evaluated their own patient. They've already diagnosed their own patient. They've already made the determination that they don't have something for that patient. So now they are taking that, that patient off their list and putting them on my list. And so for me to then start to bug them with all of these communications, I know therapists, I, I can honestly say, and I'm not saying this proudly, I kind of am, I've probably requested four operative reports or medical records in 22 years. Like I never request documentation from the doc that referred the patient. I rarely, I send the mer bare minimum. What happened to my screen? Jimmy, what are you doing? <laughs> We went Smurf mode. Um, 
Blue that's man. Not me. That's not me. <laughs> that's all right. I'm, I'm, oh um, so, so I try to communicate as little as possible. <laughs> Let me, uh, you take over for a minute, Dave. I'm going to get out and come back in. Turn your video off and turn it back on? Yeah. All right. Well, listen, folks, um, you know, I'm talking about over communicating with physician referrals, it, it, usually more concierge physicians, and they're seeing less patients overall. Uh, and Tony has, um, you know, takes a lot of in network insurances, and, and they're a little bit not necessarily volume based, but they are uh, getting referrals from physicians that are seeing a lot more patients. And so there's an example of like, I, I said like, hey, we're over communicating, we're sending a lot of messages about uh, this new referral to this team. And, and Tony's like, yeah, I do the opposite. He doesn't wanna bug them and, and all that. So that is the dichotomy of how, you know, practices can be and every practice is different. And so um, Tony has uh, certain ways about him and, and him and his practice and he knows what works and he knows what works for his patients and he knows what works for his physician referrals and, and doesn't want to uh, bother them. And that also includes, Tony also said previously uh, some other time ago that um, he also doesn't do or never has done things like dropping off pr printed reports, printed evaluations, or uh, there we go. Now you're, you're back to a uh, normal video. Go ahead. Finish your thought. So my, my thought, I was just saying that you also mentioned before that you will never, I know because some people recommend that some practice owners recommend you print out a piece of paper like this, you know, the, 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 the report, the, the Medicare eval, hey, can you sign my, can you sign my plan of care, whatever, print it out. And then you, you mentioned like, now some people say do this because it's the excuse, it gives the therapist an excuse to get in the office. I have this to sign, you know, Dr. Johnson has to sign this or whatever, or can I drop this off or whatever. But then it's a piece of paper. And now, you know, you say it creates more admin burden and, and other things, which it probably does, um, because it's something that's outside the medical record. And it's something else for the front desk person to tangibly take and all that. So I, as you jumped off and came back on, I was kind of saying, like, that's the dichotomy of like different practice models. And like we have different models and different types of patients and referring partners and all that. Yeah, you have to know your audience. If your audience, if you have a, phys your audience is your physician who's sending you patients. Um, Michael Derry down in Jacksonville, Florida. I think he is connected with other like concierge physicians. So if you have a physician that's seeing, you know, three people a day, they're charging 20,000 a year to be part of their practice and they have a limited caseload and they genuinely want to know and manage their patients they want to know about what their patients are doing they want to manage their care and they want to have a hand in everything do it 100 percent. do it i am not working with any of those docs my docs are barely surviving they're trying to keep their head above water their team their staff everybody is overworked you want to stop getting referrals from a doc you start requesting their administrative team do more work than is necessary um, that's the quickest way to, to, to stop all referrals from that office. So what we try to do is we're like, look, we're not going to bug you with anything. We're not going to request anything. We will take care of everything. Um, and, and they know that's their value proposition, even to the point where sometimes they try to refer to the hospital because they were employees of the hospital. And then the hospital therapists, no offense to them, they're amazing therapists. But like many therapists, they're trying to do what's best for the patient. They're trying to get more information. They start to bombard the doctor because they think that that's better. Um, the doctor's like, I can't. I can't answer all of these requests. I can't do all of these things. Uh, what, what one therapist sees as adding value, I see as just draining resources. You know, so from my perspective now, there are times. I, if I get a referral for a surgical procedure that I have no idea what is going on, I'm going to connect with that doc. Uh, I am fortunate enough that I have a lot of their cell phone numbers and I can just say, hey, you, you refer this patient to me. I don't know what this post-surgical procedure is. You know, can you get your assistant to send me something? And they'll do it. But it literally once every three to five years. It's that uncommon. Yeah, and I, I was going to ask you. Uh, maybe I'll hold this as a uh, as a cliffhanger for next time. I wanted to ask you 
uh, if you know of any physical therapists that charge a concierge fee, like let's say on January 1st, they charge two grand or five grand or 10 grand or something like that. I don't want you to answer. I want to do it on the next time, the next episode, uh, because we should probably move to uh, parting shots. Yeah, let's do it. Um, parting shots, you know, looking at Melanie and she was so gracious to come on and join us. Uh, I, I think that our profession goes so deep in so many levels, you know, orthopedic, neuro, pediatric, geriatric, all that stuff. It's like, yes, we, we're all American, right? We're all part of the United States, but we are so diverse and so different. You can't really think that when you say he's an American, you're, you're giving any information about that person. As physical therapists, we're all so different and unique. We, we can't have one unifying name that really gives any information about the individual. Mm, tough to beat that one. Uh, parting shot, let's go to my uh, mini consulting call that I just had with Tony where he was helping me with YouTube and uh, on, on my ideas of, of uh, patient-facing, physician-facing content, video content. Uh, again, it, yeah, it just I need to allocate some time and, and some scheduling around it. But uh, it's obvious, like everyone wants to be in the spotlight. And if you put videos on YouTube with some of the ideas and advice that Tony gave around uh, titles and keywords and that type of stuff, like best, phys best physician, best podiatrist in New York City, um, obviously that physician will love it. Um, it'll help them. Uh, you have to grow your following and you could maybe help that physician get more patients. That physician will then like you said, reciprocate. So the law of reciprocity is there. Um, and it can be done remotely over YouTube and video. Nice. Excellent. So we'll wrap up. Uh, Jimmy McKay, again, a little under the weather, the host with the most. We appreciate him uh, allowing us to uh, jump on here, uh, put this live on PT Pinecast, as well as Learn Medicare Billing. And then we edit it. We, uh, we recycle it a little bit sometimes. And some of these might go over, over to the Dave Kittle Show. Awesome. Hey, it's Dave Kittle. Are you a healthcare business owner or physical therapy practice owner who is looking to figure out your succession plan or exit strategy? We might be able to help. And in fact, we may be interested in acquiring your practice. If you're interested, you can reach out to me. Shoot me an email at dave at conciergepainrelief.com. That's D-A-V-E at C-O-N-C-I-E-R-G-E, painrelief.com or you can call me at any time, 646-781-8884.